Hello everyone and welcome to EduSearch Clinics. So this is a latest guideline that has been issued by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. A lot of experts have participated in it and there is a lot of discussion going on on these guidelines. So we thought that we'll create a summary, a review. We are not changing any points because it's a guideline that has to be adhered to. But we also need to understand the difference between guideline and law. Okay, because that will solve a lot of queries that some of you may have in mind. Then we will look at the guidelines. The point that they have discussed are what is an intensive care unit? Who can be an intensivist in India? So these are guidelines by the ministry. So practically applicable in India. They have also given criteria for when to admit, when not to admit, when to discharge and how to monitor while shifting the patient to ICU or while shifting out of ICU. So minimum stabilization that is required and how to do inter-facility transfer that is from one hospital to another and so on and so forth. So the first point that I would like to highlight is that a guideline is a set of recommendations, basically many times from field experts or professional associations or societies who give set of recommendations or best practices which are usually ethical, which help us in following the norms that are there for a particular disease or a particular clinical scenario. And the aim of guidelines like these is to improve the operations, okay, improve the bed turnover, improve patient satisfaction, as well as the performance of a department or a hospital as a whole. Okay, these are basically industry standards, okay, and they are given by experts or professional associations. But it is important to understand that guideline is not law. Okay, so when we see law, it can be, say, a common law, okay, which is a law that is given by legal bodies of the country. It can be judge made law, okay, and it can be criminal law. So there are three types of law that are given by the modern legal system in India. But for all the points that are not created by legal bodies, judges or the criminal law, the guidelines will not be backed by law. Okay, So this is very important to understand that each and every point in a guideline is not met by the law. And when we get into points like this, as we will see in this guideline also, law should take precedence over guidelines at these points. So guidelines are not like postulates that we used to study in school that they are always true guidelines are basically recommendations and they are given to improve your practice okay but whenever it comes to practical problem solving law should take precedence over guidelines so now coming to these guidelines what is an intensive care unit and they have said that the synonymous terms are critical care unit and intensive therapy unit as we all know, it has to be a designated area in a hospital which has multidisciplinary participation for focused management of critically ill patients. These are basically patients which require continuous and intensive observation and interventions from doctors, nurses or support staff with equipment and paraphernalia that is necessary for sustaining life till recovery. So an intensive care unit needs to have all these points. It should have a multidisciplinary team, doctors, nurses and support staff who are trained to take care of patients who are critically ill and who need continuous and intensive observation and interventions. The guideline also puts down some recommendations on who should be an intensivist. The person should have a postgraduate qualification in any branch of medicine, say internal medicine, emergency medicine or pulmonary medicine or anesthesia or even general surgery. But with that, there should be say a DM in critical care or pulmonary critical care or a DNB or a certificate course like IDCCM or IFCCM. There can be a postdoctoral fellowship in critical care or equivalent qualifications from abroad, which is America, Australia, New Zealand, UK and Canada. So these are usually the countries that people go to for critical care fellowships or at least one year training in a reputed ICU abroad. So this is a doctor with a postgraduate qualification in a degree and then a super specialization or a postdoctoral fellowship in critical care, right? 
Now, if you are pursuing a career to be an intensive is after MBBS, they have given two points. One is an ISCCM certificate course with three year training program in ICU. And they should have at least two years of experience in ICU after this with at least 50% of time spent in the ICU. Extensive experience in ICU in India after MBBS is considered at least three years of experience in ICU. So this is after MBBS. So for all other doctors, the intensivist post is out of question. So if you want an intensivist post, the minimum qualification is MBBS and beyond. They, these are the pathways after MBBS and after a post-graduation. Now coming to patient management, the ICU admission criteria are fairly simple. All patients who need intensive monitoring, organ support, or who have high risk of complications needs to be managed in ICU. Which are basically these patients, they need basically the support for CNS, CVS and respiratory system. Fairly logical, nothing new, nothing rocket science. Okay, all patients who have altered level of consciousness, who are hemodynamically instable or who have breathing issues and saturation that is low. So CNS, CBS, RS, these need admission in the ICU. Severe acute or chronic illness or severe acute illness, they need intensive monitoring or organ support. Anticipation of deterioration. All patients of major surgery or major trauma with or without an intraoperative event, but they need, say, intensive monitoring, organ support, or high risk of complications. All these patients need admission in ICU. So there is a point on when a patient is not to be shifted to ICU. There has to be an informed refusal. So this point is in debate in a lot of groups, but we need to understand that if the patient or relatives give an informed refusal, and this is a legal term that has been used in the guideline, then the patient will not be admitted to IC. Disease with a treatment limitation plan, again, if you are not going to help the patient by admission, then it can be an informed refusal for admission to IC. Now, there is a point on living will or advanced directive against ICU care. However, these patients usually are terminal ill with a medical judgment of futility. Now, this is a very separate concept. As a part of this guideline, it is very difficult to implement because if we discuss medical judgment of futility, there need to be at least around five doctors across a primary and secondary medical care team who have to decide that the treatment is futile. This has to be then passed by a magistrate court and that is when futility can be decided. So as a legal term, futility needs an assessment over one to two days and you can't keep the patient in ward or ICU till these two days are taken care of. Okay, So where to keep the patient while the futility assessment is going on? As of now, these things are not clear in India. Okay, Again, coming to living will or advanced directive, it's a separate topic, but most of our patients don't have legally bound directive, which says that the patient should not be admitted to ICU. There may be a directive which says that patient should not be intubated, Okay, but there is no specific clause as far as we have seen that the patient should not be admitted to ICU. So, a directive against ICU care and medical judgment of utility. These points maybe will get clarified in future, but they are there in the guideline of 2023. We saw in COVID that there are some patients who can be managed with aggressive management in vaults because of resource limitation. So this point has been mentioned in the guideline, which is correct. So no ICU admission if the patients have low priority criteria and there is resource limitation. Okay. Like I said, advanced directive, living will and futility are legal terms and legal procedures are required for it. Now, when to discharge a patient from ICU? Very simple, CNS, CVS and RS need to recover. So, parameters accordingly should be followed. Reasonable resolution and stability of the illness for which the patient was admitted to ICU. With informed decision making from the patient and family, they should agree to shift the patient to ward or home for palliative care if that is the treatment. Lack of benefit again is a medical decision and it is not obligating family agreement. 
at these points the patient can be shifted out of hospital to a rehab or a palliative care setup or to home with home care setup if there is lack of benefit from aggressive care again this should be discussed with the family icu discharge can also be there for infection control reasons but in these cases in the isolation all the support should be there if required rationing again is a concept that is where resources are limited so if rationing is required there should be a transparent sop of the hospital that is fair consistent and reasonable so these are all the points where you can discharge a patient from the icu now if a patient has been suggested icu but there are say lack of beds or you are shifting in the process of shifting say half an hour is going to be required the minimum monitoring criteria have been given and these will be legally binding that is cvs rs and cns so pulse blood pressure capillary refill hemodynamic stability respiratory rate breathing saturation mainly respiratory system and cvs look at the glasgow coma scale and evpu one of them for the cns so temperature monitoring and blood sugar monitoring so this is the basic monitoring of a patient that is required again very logical nothing new a good standard of care if you are doing this while the patient awaits icu bed when you want to transfer the patient inside a hospital minimum stabilization again is abc of trauma secure airway breathing that is adequate oxygenation and ventilation if the patient is not intubated patient should be able to speak a sentence you know bomb not trauma training that airway is secure so airway breathing circulation stable hemodynamics ongoing correction of hypo or hyperglycemia or electrolyte disturbances and initiation of definitive therapy can be done before transfer say external fixation of a fractured limb can be done in emergency start anti epileptics if there are seizures anti arrhythmics if there are arrhythmias intravenous antibiotics for sepsis so this is the bare minimum stabilization and all of us do this in the casualty till the patient is getting transferred and that is what is recommended in the guidelines again fairly logical inter facility transfer the monitoring is more or less the same that you require while the patient is awaiting icu and that is cvs rs cns so pulse bp capillary refill temperature respiratory rate breathing saturation and gcs these are all the experts who contributed in forming this guideline they are fairly exhaustive fairly logical bearing two or three points which are legal i think the guideline is fairly good and something that all of us can follow for safe practice as well as for patient safety thank you